Uh, Today I'll be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. What does the worker gain from his toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men. Yet they cannot fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before. And God will call the past to account. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, Lots of good things happening. I just want you to know the screams in my house and the fact that my wife's shoulder is hurt has nothing to do with Scott's story. (laughs) (laughs) Or the fact that they seem to be looking for more ministers. (laughs) It's all the way you see it, right? Uh, no, this is an exciting time because I'm really glad we're going to be getting some more people in. That's going to be great. So new youth minister, new family minister. This will be the first time we've had four since I've been here. And so that's going to be exciting uh, just to be able to have some more people to work with. Uh, besides all that, Jacob should be here next Sunday. Uh, that's his first day. And he's going to be an intern for the summer for us. We don't get to keep him. So any work that you have that you need to have done, let me know. And uh, Jacob is coming. So, you know, mowing lawns or if you want to clean your garage or, you know, just let me know what you can, that Jacob can do. Ken and Jean should be back this week. So there's lots of things that are going on. On Friday, we have a special opportunity. John has set up the Feed My Starving Children. And so he needs people to sign up and people to go and help do that. So it's one of the things we're able to do. It doesn't take that long. It isn't that hard, but it makes a huge impact in the world. And so it's one of those things that can be really, really great. So I hope you'll take part in that. Uh, This has been an interesting time trying to think about eternity. And how long do we have? I know, eternity is how long it's going to take for the sermon to be over. (laughs) That's usually what people think of is, oh, this is going to take forever. So we'll try and speed it up a little bit. I like the way Solomon describes all of this in Ecclesiastes and when he's talking about this and exploring all of these things and and trying to get a handle on what's the meaning of life and how it all fits together. And he comes up with this idea about eternity and that somehow, what do we get out of all of this? What do we gain out of all the things that we've done? He writes about wisdom and he says wisdom is something that is great for us to have, that God has made everything beautiful in its time, that... (coughs) Okay, let's start again. That he has made everything beautiful in its time. He's put eternity in our hearts, but we are starting in the middle. And whenever you start in the middle, it's hard to know what is happening in the future or what has already happened. When you walk into a room and there's already a conversation going on, do you understand everything? Probably not. You don't know what has been said. You don't know what they're saying about it. You don't know, and and you really can't know where it's all going to go from here. So we find ourselves in the middle. And we're created eternal creatures. But created to be eternal doesn't mean that we're never having a start point. God never has a start point. He is eternal in both directions. We are not. We had a creation time, a creation point when we came into this life, when we're able to be here. And then it goes forever. 
And, and that's really the way it's going to be. And so as you look at that, that's important for us to understand that, that we see it. It's all around us. And he says, God put it in our hearts, but it's like walking into the middle of a conversation. You're not going to quite understand it all. And that's what he talks about. He says, the best thing you can do is enjoy the gifts that God gave you. It's one of the things that we're able to do. We can't find the end of eternity. It's everything kind of seems like it's going in a circle. We don't do a very good job of planning for the end. In fact, there's a number of people in our society that just live one day at a time. In fact, maybe less than a day at a time. And we see them around at different times because they're just concerned about the thing that needs to happen in the next hour, in the next day, in the next few minutes. It's an addictive type personality and maybe they need something to drink or some kind of a drug or some kind of a, of a fix, but their whole life is summed up in not eternity, but in the next few minutes. They're not even thinking two weeks ahead. They're thinking right now. What can I get right now? I need this right now. And some of us do a little bit better than that. Uh, we plan for the weekend, right? Because it's all going to be better once the weekend gets here. Our job will be over. We have two whole days to relax. Well, half of one is you know, you're here in church, but you have time off, and so you plan everything for the weekend, and you try to take the time that you can to get through work so that finally there's a couple of days, and it goes so fast. And for some people, that's all they live for is just for the weekend, or sometimes it's for summer vacation, or next year we're going to go do that, and so we're pushing out just a little bit further on each one of these things. A few years ahead is enough. Or sometimes we use it the opposite. I'm going to do something fun when, you know, when I get married or when we have kids or when the kids are grown or when the kids are out of the house. And, you know, so then we're waiting until we can, we're looking forward to, but we don't usually think about eternity and what that really means. So how long is eternity? It's bigger than that. Whatever you thought of, it's bigger than that. So the illustration I saw a long time ago was if you take a dove, we have Stanley as our dove, and you let the dove take a grain of sand, all right? One grain per trip. So there's a grain of sand, and he is going to fly from here to the moon, 221,576 miles, put down that grain of sand, and then fly back. This is a very special dove. You realize he can fly without atmosphere. And fly back and pick up the next grain of sand, and then he's going to fly up and deposit that next grain of sand, and then he's going to fly back and, well, you get the idea. Uh, this whole thing. So he's going to take the sand from every desert that there is, from every beach that there is, and by the time he's gotten every single grain of sand from every beach and from every desert, eternity will not quite have started yet. Because it's bigger than that. So to give you a perspective on this, if you live for a hundred years in Stanley takes off on the day you're born with his grain of sand. And by the time you live your hundred years, okay, you got a few more than the rest of us. That's just the way it is. But by the time you live your hundred years, Stanley is finally delivered his grain of sand and, and come back to earth and he's ready for the next grain of sand. Right? That's a key for it. The only thing is Stanley would have to fly 2,200 miles a day in order to get there. And so Stanley's not quite that fast. We wouldn't even get to the moon. We wouldn't even, okay, yes, yeah, just bigger than that. 
And we can't even, and that's not even the start. He says it's so much bigger than that. And so whatever shape we have or way that we want to put how all this works, uh, it's usually bigger than what we can think. And so it's hard for us to understand this because we really can't grasp what that's even like. I mean, just if we had to pick a grain of sand and take it home and then drive back and get another grain of sand and we didn't have that far to go, but still, if you're only taking one grain at a time, it's going to take a long time to get the beach in your backyard. I mean, that's going to take a while. I think Jesus says it best in John 10. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so as Jesus claims to be the door of the sheep, that's the door for us, the way for us to enter into this better eternity. He says, you know, everybody before that has a plan for your life. A lot of times they try and sell you things or talk you into things. And if you just follow me, I'll tell you how to do all of, and it usually doesn't turn out that well. And God's plan is usually a whole different direction. If you follow God's plan, good things are going to happen. If you follow everybody else's plan, it may not turn out so well. But as you're thinking about all of this and how all this fits together, just being able to look at this whole thing, do you, how do you get abundant life? Well, abundant life isn't just about the fact that, well, I'm going to live a long time. It's going to be terrible, I'm going to be miserable every day, and I'm going to live. Well, you don't want that. No, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. You get to play every day, right? It depends on who you follow. Because sometimes we follow the wrong person. And then it doesn't turn out so well, and we don't see the things that happen. Sometimes people don't want to believe in eternity. And so they think it's as simple as saying, well, it doesn't exist. You know, I don't believe in it. I don't know what it's like. I, you know, I don't even think it's going to be real. Life is the time God gives you to determine how you spend eternity. And just denying that doesn't mean it isn't true. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Jimmy said 40% of the people don't believe in hell. It doesn't mean it isn't real. Some of us may not believe in Chicago. Some of us may not, well, I've never, you know, I've only been there once. I don't believe in Paris or Rome or any of those places because obviously they don't exist because I've never been there. So how can, yeah. We relate it only to our own experience, and we haven't been to eternity yet, so it seems impossible. But it isn't impossible, because God is real, and if God is real, then eternity is determined by how we live. And that's just really the way it's put, and, and everyone understands that. It is, however, not a reward for living a good life. It is for being in a relationship with God and being forgiven by Jesus Christ. Some people think, well, we get to be in eternity and in heaven because everything's going to be great and wonderful because I have been good all my life. First, that's a lie. But beside that, even if you had been good all your life, that is not what it takes to get to the good side of eternity. It takes being a Christian. It takes living this life for God. And if we refuse to follow God, we do have that other side of eternal punishment. We don't want to decide now and then get it later. We want the instant thing. And we're so obsessed with this instant. Everyone is trying to do things faster. Everyone is trying to do things so that, you know, it's just going to take 
just a few seconds to be able to do this and this and this and we can get through our life and it'll be so much better because of all the things we can do. Everything now is instant, right? We can get instant spaghetti. All you got to do is add, yeah, I don't know what you add, maybe hot water or something. You can get instant spaghetti and it tastes just like the real thing, right? Well, you know, you, some things you have to give up. So the, there is this instant idea of what we can pick up and the grocery shelves are lined with all of these things that are just instant, you know, just pop it open, heat it up. And we've got a microwave to heat it up and it'll all be done, it all works. In fact, they have the restaurants where you can drive through and take your order on this little sign outside they will hand you, wrapped in tin foil, a blob of calories and grease, and you will hand them money, and you can drive off and eat it. Right? I mean, we have, we have invented all of these things, and so we have instant everything. So I found a few. Here's the instant race, the annual race. And some of you can't read the bottom. Uh, it's the zero-mile fun run. So, runners at your mark, ready, set, go, okay, come get your t-shirt. <laughs> right? We're done. That's all we wanted was the shirt anyway. It's the zero mile run, or this one. Uh, yeah, I've never seen this before. Instant underpants. Just add water. Doesn't that mean soggy... I don't think I can recommend this one at all. I mean, but it is instant. And why would we ever have such a thing as this? Because we want it fast. We don't want to have to wait. We don't want to wait for an eternity, a reward, or anything. I want it right now. What I want you to realize is that things do transfer. So don't give up what you want most. For what you want now. I think that's important. This life does decide eternity. And we tend to focus on the change that occurs in the next one. But it is this entire life. So if up until now things have not been so good in your life. You're still here. You're still alive. And all you have to do is make a change. And certainly life can be better after that course if you did good in the first part and now you're messing up life can change and you don't want to end up in that place what we learn here and how we prepare is transferable to the next one now not everything but a lot of the things that we learn here are transferable to the next one. And so this is very, very important. Our character, our habits, our knowledge, our personality all transfers to the next one. You see them talking to people as Jesus appears and is transfigured. He talks to Moses and Elijah. They're not two bodiless spirits that are up there somewhere and says, yeah, we used to be somebody. I don't know who. No, they are Moses and they are Elijah because they still know who they were and who they are. You are going to be the same person in eternity that you are right now. And so all of your character gets to transfer with you. All of that work that you do on learning things transfers with you. All of the personality traits that you have transfer with you because those aren't just physical things. All of your character, some of your habits, our love and joy and peace and patience that we have developed here transfer with us. And that's why it's so critical and so important that we work on those things now because we get to keep those. That's us. That's who we become. And that's why this is so critical to be able to learn some of this because it is from now until Stanley gets back for that last piece of grain of sand. And you get to keep it that long. When you learn how to love here, you get to keep love for that long. And so all of those things are important to us, and when we see Scripture talking about those, it's very, very important. You see, the, 
the sins that we commit here, yes, we commit here. But also the forgiveness that you have here transfers to the next one. And if you have forgiveness here, you have forgiveness in heaven. Because that's where Jesus is. And that's what I mean. The, a lot of these things transfer with us. Now, there is the other side of this. If you have sins here and there is no forgiveness here, those may transfer with you. And if you're an angry, frustrated person here, those things transfer with you. And if you're mean and arrogant, that transfers with you. You are going to have it forever if you don't figure out how to deal with life. So maybe it's time to figure out how to deal with life because you really want to have that forever. You get to keep all of those things. All the sins you commit, if there's no forgiveness, you, it doesn't transfer. All of the anger that you have, all of the frustration you have, all of those times when all those other people mess up. Well, certainly there won't be anybody in hell that messes up, right? You'll never be upset then of anybody else who's done things wrong. Do you realize every single person will not be fair and will not give you a break? And that's where you choose to live? Wow. Okay, it's your choice, I mean, but those things transfer. And that's why it's so important that the fruit of the Spirit is put in our life because that transfers as well. So when we plan, we plan all the time. So if we're going to plan for the future, we plan for a job, right? There are things that you have to do in order to get the job that you want, whatever it is. Uh, some people go to school to get that. Some people have some special kind of training for the future. So whatever job you wanted to get, even if you want to go in the army, you have to qualify to get in the army. It is not that simple. And once you get in, they will train you because they're not going to put up with that. In order to get a job, there is some training. So if we're going to plan for health, how do we plan for health? Well, there's some things you can do in order to have good health. Sometimes the way we eat, sometimes the exercise, the doctor, the vitamin, just trying to be healthy. Health doesn't happen by accident, right? You can't just sit around on the couch eating chocolate and think, well, I'm going to be healthy. It just doesn't happen that way. Planning for financial security. That just happens by accident, right? I'm going to win the lottery. Of course it happens by accident. Yeah, if I ever win, it would be an accident because that's just not something that's going to happen. It means retirement. It means saving for some people. It means investment. It means insurance. It means, you know, trying to take care of things if that's ever going to be possible. And the last one I have is planning for your spiritual life, that doesn't happen by accident either. You see, we have to read, we have to learn, to study and practice. Spirituality doesn't happen by accident. And when you get to heaven, you do not immediately know what the Bible says. Yeah, you're still going to have to learn it there as much as if you learned it here. It'll just be a lot more confusing because you're getting into the middle of a conversation that they gave you the script for and you didn't read it. So now it really seems confusing, right? And somebody walks up to you and says, hey, good to have you. I'm Moses. And you go, huh? Who is it? You, know, you have no clue who you're even talking to. It's not going to work that way. And some will do more study than others, and some will do more service than others. It's not a specific way that you develop spirituality, but th whatever you developed is developed here. And so when do we need these? Well, the job's now to take care of family and take care of the things that you need. Health is now because we need to be alive, right? Uh, alive is a good thing. Uh, financial security is going to be need needed later. But spiritual life, that's needed to have a relationship with God. 
The odd thing about it is some people leave out the last one. And go, well, I'm not sure I need spiritual life. As long as I've got a job and my health and, and money enough to take care of myself, I'll be okay. What I want you to realize is how many of these go for the next life. Well, you're going to lose your health in order to go, right? I mean, you can't still be healthy when you're there, so at some point that's going to be unimportant. You can't do your job and you can't spend any money. There's only one thing that helps, and that is your spiritual life. So most people believe there will be something after and they live as if there's not anything. Because if I can just live as if there's not anything after, it means I can do whatever I want. And I think that's the real reason why people deny hell, people deny eternity. They say, I'm only here for this life anything, anyway. Everything takes work. Doesn't matter what it is, everything takes work. If you're going to have a marriage, it isn't going to be instant. You know, it'd be nice if we had that little kit, you know, just add water, instant marriage. It doesn't work that way for some reason. We haven't come up with that. It takes some building and some working on it. A career doesn't happen the first day you start work. It takes some time. You have to be able to build that. It takes some practice to be able to get good at things. Playing video games does not become an instant thing, right? I mean, you're not good at it the first time you pick up the... And I'm looking over here because you guys have got to be the best ones. It, it isn't this just the first day you pick it up and, and you're perfect at it. You can just go on forever and ever, right? It isn't for me. I don't play the things because it lasts about five seconds and I crash. You know, it doesn't matter what game it is. Five seconds, boom, you hit a wall. I know. And nobody's going to move the wall. Boom, you hit a wall. Boom, you hit a wall. This is fun. <laughs> so what if you could never crash? I mean, you never crashed. And you could just play and play and go on forever. Or at least you could start with 10,000 lives at the very beginning. Right? And, and, and that would be great, wouldn't it? None of you guys play video games, right? <laughs> okay, he does. At least he's willing to admit to it. Very, thank you. <laughs> you actually do have that. It's called the reset button. There isn't a single game out there that doesn't have millions of lives and millions of cars to crash and millions of... Because all you have to do is restart the game. And then you've got another one and another one and another one. It's eternal. Is that why we play that? So I want you to give it another picture of this. What if hell would be not the... Okay, I've got another life and another life and longer and longer and longer. Hell would be, I'm going to go crash. 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 And whatever you send that guy to do, whether it's to shoot, drive, whatever it is, your life is nothing but one crash after another. And you will never get out of it because you didn't play it that well at the beginning. Some people get a little further than others. For the rest, we just, we just crash. I'm not sure it really makes a difference for us, if you think about that. The last scripture, John 5, 24, Jesus says it this way, and I want you to know this is Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. 
Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. He says, whoever hears and believes has eternal life. Don't take that as a way in order to do that. There's more involved with it. But he says he doesn't come into judgment. He passes from death to life. He's talking in spiritual terms here. He passes out of that terrible, awful person that he was into true eternal life. We're all going to live forever. I mean, you can't get out of it. Even if you kill yourself, you just start over again because you're not getting out of it. You just start again, except for in a much better or worse place. And so he gives you two different things. The hour is coming and is now here. So when he says that, it's now the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and live. And I really believe he's saying that those people who understand what life is about come and they repent and they die to themselves and they're buried with Christ in baptism and they're raised to walk a new life because Jesus says that was already here. And they follow the commandments he's given. And then he says the hour is coming when those who are in the tombs. Now the first guys weren't in the tombs. The second guys are those who are in the tombs hear his voice. And then there's resurrection. Some are raised to life who have done good. And some are raised to judgment who have done evil. I want you to realize Jesus says it. It's not some theory somewhere. It's not an Old Testament passage. Jesus says it. That some will be raised to judgment. And by judgment... I don't think they're going to come out very good on the other end because they have done evil. He's really clear. And it isn't that we don't understand. So, the question is, can you see your path clearly? Do you know exactly what's going to happen in eternity? The good news is you don't have to wait. You can know exactly what's going to happen in eternity. And you can change it today. So that it's going to be one of the most greatest, glorious times ever. It's going to be abundant life in eternity forever with God. Boy, if that isn't you, fix it today. Come on, we stand and sing.